Hey guys. Well, uh, thank you very much. That was a nice introduction. So I'm Fred. I'm uh, from Amberson Machine. I'm technical lead there. And I was part of the, the core team for Maxon, for the Maxon project. So a little bit about us. Uh, we're a design and motion studio based in London and recently Los Angeles. And in a nutshell, we believe in uh, strong and simple ideas and executing them with confidence. So just a quick little uh, stroll about uh, our studio. So this is uh, where we work. This is where the magic happens. If you were to go further out, uh, this is a wider shot of it. If we're located at the top. It's a really nice historic building. And if you go further out, you'll see that we're canal based. So which is a nice thing for me because I used to live in the Netherlands and I do miss my canals. So if you hang out there for long enough, you can probably see us riding to work in our preferred method of transportation. And when we're not busy working or waiting on renders, you can see us at the ping pong table. That's where we sort our demons out. So this is the part where I would show you our work in our showreel. But we have so much to cover today that uh, you can just go to mbsm.com and take my word for it. Uh, just check it out if you want. So Maxon approached us because they know that we use Cinema 4D as our main tool for the most part. And they're like, guys, can you come up and uh, do uh, a piece for us that just shows off all the new stuff in release 18? Stuff like fracturing, uh, MoGraph improvements, and new shaders. And we said, all right, cool. Uh, but anything else that we should know? And they're like, no. You can do whatever you want. Just, just don't make it too weird. And uh, naturally, in the first week, this happened, uh, which was a bit, a bit on the weird side. That's what happens when uh, we just started playing with uh, just uh, some mocap data. So we're like, all right, guys, this, uh, this is fun and all, but we kind of need some structure. So we gave ourselves some restrictions. So we thought, uh, all right, well, let's have it be a play in our name. Let's make it about verses. From that, naturally, it distilled into battles. And with battles, we really wanted to do like a slow motion approach. You know, If we were going to animate something, we didn't want to go too involved, too in depth with it. So slow motion battles. And then we really wanted to do photogrammetry and 3D scans, because if you're working with like a lot of things, you want everything to really shine. And while we could have modeled a lot of things, we wanted to just, why not worry why not stop worrying about modeling and just have something that already looks really good and then just make it even better? So we wanted to do something more moody and not graphic, because usually the stuff that we do is uh, graphic and clean uh, and very designy. This was supposed to be more filmic. And lastly, we wanted to deal with patterns just to bring in some design element to it and stay away from uh, the, uh, the filmic aspect. And then wrapped it all up in an abstraction. So here's some of our mood boards real quick of everything about versus. So we thought natural versus design, paint versus pattern, chaos versus structure, organic and geometric and geometric structures, and real objects, objects versus uh, just plain environments and backgrounds. We also referenced a lot of uh, paintings like Van Dyck's Samson and Delilah, as well as Rubens' The Taking of the Innocents. Because what we like about that is there's so much happening and quite a lot of characters, but it's all suspended in a still image. So along with that, we really liked just the ambience and the mood of Dutch still lives, particularly just how everything is still and everything seems to have its place, and as well as cloth. And last but not least, these are some of our references uh, for patterns, which uh, initially we were thinking about using uh, patterns for camouflage, but you know, later it evolved into something else. So before I go more in depth, let's just really watch the video real quick for those of you who haven't seen it or who have been seeing it just without audio.
So yeah, made with Cinema 4D, and no animals were harmed during the making of this film. So cool, I just told you about our references, our inspiration, uh, showed you the video. But so how do we actually go about starting this? You know, how do we go from those restrictions to creating something? And the answer is R&D, research and development. R&D is the core of what we do. It's like through R&D that we make sense of the project. You know, it's like making sense of things via experimentation. And we try new things every day, like every day, to the point that we have a, a dailies folder. So you can see there's, there's Maxon and dailies. That's like there's tons of renders in each folder for every day. And the cool thing about this is it allows us to just experiment a lot and then just play and we can make sense of like what works, what doesn't, and maybe good ideas. And this is something that we've always loved about Cinema 4D is just how quickly we can make new versions of things and they, they just they look really cool. So with that, you just saw the animals. So there are characters. And so we, we knew we wanted to photo scan them, but we didn't want to go through the hassle of actually getting live animals and the permits and then having them sit still. So what better still animal is there than one that's already dead? By natural reasons, I hope. So we l reached out to some local taxidermists, and one of them was like, yeah, I like, uh, like the project. Don't worry too much about the budget. And so from here, we picked three. And so this was one of the projects where we did 3D scanning ourselves and also to, through one of our good you know, friends, FBFX. So this is their setup. And this is ours. But you know what? It worked just as well. So that's Ollie setting it up. And that's Emily just you know, turning the armadillo around. So you can see you, know, you don't need too much stuff to just get a really good scan. So while all those 3D scans were processing and doing their things, we, uh, we just had time to do stuff. So I like to say the early days are the good days, because you can just do whatever you want. So while the scans were processing and stuff, we started playing with patterns, color, and we got a 3D scan of a dog, which we called Bruce. So I'm going to guide you through the dog days. So this is Bruce. And of course, this is all done, done in cinema. Uh, so this is Bruce with a lot of uh, vibrant patterns on him. Bruce with kind of like a tie-dye kind of effect to him and like a nice sherbet shading. Bruce with like some painty wax, kind of like a wallpaper camouflage back when we were thinking that camouflage was going to be a big thing. Some pattern that just reminds me of The Shining, uh, kind of like a modernist de style kind of deal kind of like a more urban approach that was kind of like hip hop -y, kind of like graffiti scribblings. Polka dots, because why not? Uh, a more abstract, something that feels like a, like a Japanese sunset or something. Uh, milk and cookies. Bruce with uh, big old bug eyes. And then here we were playing around with animated uh, texture real quick. It's funny, the, the strobing was because the render farm was dying. But we were like, hey, you know what? It works. And nobody's going to see this. But then again, here I am showing it to you. So we also started playing with just like deforming the geometry. But we were like, maybe that's too much of a stretch. So let's try something else. Maybe if we shade it differently, it'll look cool. Maybe. But uh, no. So we quickly abandoned this approach. We also really love the idea of how there's now the substance link with Cinema 4D. So this is what we started playing around with. And it was a cool approach to using substance. But when you think about the actual what's going on, some of us were torn because it kind of looks like he's been run over by like a car with paint several times. So put that in the bin. Nobody's going to see this. Then here's a, a dodo bird. And so you can see there's like 2D uh, patterns projected all over. Here is just a still object. This is like a tangerine or a, a mandarin, depends, with 2D patterns. But yeah, so we were thinking, all right, well, these 2D patterns are cool, but let's try something else. So we decided to uh, work on animal-based patterns. And what I mean by that 
is we really wanted to play with like all of, like the elements uh, that you can get from like an animal. So in this case, it's all the negative space on the ridges of the crab. So we had that. Then we thought maybe if we replace you know those little things with kind of like these donut Cheerio things, maybe that'd be cool. And then we decided maybe let's focus, bring back some of like the 2D patterns and then maybe do something that's kind of like fish eggs or something, just really bring a nautical theme to it. So like that's interesting. Then a similar render, this uh, is actually an eyeball, but I'll tell you more about that, that later. So before we had an armadillo, we were actually playing around with the idea of a pangolin, which is like a similar kind of like an armadillo, but it's got like a tail. And this is, I think, like a cloner and spline wrap and some other, yes, yeah, some other trickery. So that's one. This was our first approach at like kind of like frog's feet, but that was a bit too abstract and it kind of just looks like like noses, like noses that are red. That's not that's not good. We had these weird scales, kind of like an armadillo meets a snake. So it's a bit weird, I'm not sure about it. But uh we kind of like this, which is uh kind of like an octopus and we really want to animate those suckers, but we just didn't we were abandoning the project by then, but I'm glad we got to animate these little frog feet because they're, they're just cool and very, very satisfying to watch them. But so enough with like 2D patterns and animal-based patterns. Let's talk about uh, generative patterns. So these were just all procedural, all done in Cinema 4D, just like a mix of different geometry with like different deformers, effectors, displacers, you name it. So here's that same setup, a bit more embellished with uh, some animation. So still, I mean, this is really early days, but that's the beauty of like the dailies folder. You can just see what works and what doesn't. Here is uh, when we were playing with the Veroni fracturing, and we're like, oh, that's looking interesting, and it kind of like reminds us of, of armadillos already. So we tried that, but with the procedural thing, this is uh, some other ones that we got. So it's all very similar setup, just different fracturings, and it's really nice because it's maybe one or two different bits of geometry, and then you just swap things around, and you can get all of these other completely different looks. So really nice, all procedural. We never had to make anything editable, editable for this. So here's a few more, like close up. Here's one, and then some changes later, and you got that. So while we were working on these, uh, these patterns, we're also working on, on the actual animals. Because if you just have animals fighting, that's cool, but why are they fighting? Like, is just everyone really angry or something? So why don't we make them warriors? So we were referencing these uh, kind of like war paints, and we wanted each animal to have its own war paint or its own look. So we mock them up, as you can see here, and we use substance to just paint over them and later in cinema finalize them. So for the armadillo, we used the first one. For the, uh, the crab, we went for the one all the way over there with the three stripes. And here you can see the studio manager, Emily, spending an afternoon just painting that, which we then photographed and just put it on uh, the crab. And we're like, all right, this is looking cool. We're getting somewhere. But it needs maybe a bit more of a story. So we were thinking about like, you know, they should have flags or banners. So it's kind of like their family, you know, or like different lands fighting, kind of like uh, Capulets versus Montagues, Bloods versus Crips, uh, Ajax versus Eindhoven. Uh, here's some of our references. And then from there, what we took is that and designed some patterns for like for each and every animal, armadillo, butterfly, owl, you get it. So we got that and brought it into cinema. And so this was our initial approach. But then we went more for something a bit more classic, like this. But we strayed away from the neon look because it was a bit, a bit too much. It was taken away from the mood that we wanted. Like we wanted something dark and moody and not necessarily high tech and kind of like cyberpunky. Which brings us to uh, the lighting and mood of it. So like the Dutch still life. So like I said, we wanted to break away from the really graphic stuff 
and just have it be more, literally have more volume, which is why we started introducing fog. So that's Bruce again. And now you can see there's, he's on a tabletop in a way, kind of like in a Dutch still life. And there's fog and there's stuff in the distance. We'll get to what's on his face in a bit. So here's the first quick scan of the chameleon. But now, you know, he's got the fog, but now we added fruit and household objects, very much more like a, like a Dutch still life. Then we took it even further, and here's a, a frog, which is just, we embraced all the slimy stuff about it, even like you can see some slimy fruit in the back. And then we brought it all together back with, uh, you know, bringing the, the 2D patterns projected just everywhere. And that's when we were like, well, we're not feeling it. Maybe it's time to abandon projected patterns over the surface. And then in the dailies, uh, somebody did this. And we're like, that's it. That's, that's more like it. That's what we want. So it's more like Delft or Chinese pottery, but brought into a third dimensional world. And we're like, all right, this is, this is cool. We can work with this. But now, I don't want to give you guys the impression that we know what we're doing all the time, because there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make it through. So I'm just going to show you through some of the stuff that just, you know, nobody thought we'd ever show, but here I am. So with the whole painterly approach thing, we thought, well, maybe if it's all just a painting, it's a moving painting. And we're like, all right, that's really interesting. How about if now, if we animate it? And we're like, well, that's, that's interesting, but we didn't think it would do well enough for like a whole minute, minute and a half. We felt it was too much too gimmicky, even if we applied it to, um, to like back in our style of the Dutch still life. So yeah, and he's showing his butt. So another thing that we experimented with was the idea of masks, which was on Bruce's face before, that blue thing. So in this one, it's, uh, it was cloth and fabric, uh, but it kind of changed it a bit too much. It made our characters seem more like fantasy world, like he looks like he's a wizard, and we're like, eh, that's not, not going to do it. Especially not when you put like metal armor on it, and suddenly it seems like a weird dino warrior. So we're like, that's, that's not working, but cool. You mix those two together, and so we, we draped and wrapped some cloth around the face. And we're like, all right, that's kind of interesting, but some of us really liked it, and some of us thought it kind of looked a bit like he just had underwear on his face, which is a bit, a bit weird. But not as weird as a frog with a falcon mask. So that's supposed to be a falcon mask, but it just screams this weird S&M bondage thing. And we're like, all right, we definitely can't put that in the film, even though some of us wanted to, mostly me. So now time to talk about the, the hero shot. Because you know, if we have these animals fighting, there needs to be a payoff. And we didn't want like one animal to end up being victorious over another. So why not just go back to uh, those Renaissance paintings and focus on the movement and the fighting and not, not fighting babies, even though they're hilarious. But we really like the lighting in it. We also, going into the idea of parallel thought, we found this and we we're like, whoa, that's kind of like what we're doing, but, but not. And it's also a bit too graphic and violent. So using everything that I've shown you, this is one of our initial concept art. And we're like, all right, this is getting somewhere, but let's bring in some of the more Renaissance things. So this is the final composition that we mocked up. So we're like, all right, this has got everything we want. It's got animals. It's got cloth. It's got an, like a dark environment. And in true Renaissance fashion, the composition revolves the golden ratio. Not because we care, just because why not? And then finally, so while we're putting all this together, we made an animatic and we sent it to the guys that resonate. Because really, even if you have amazing visuals, it's the audio that sells it. So Lucas, I read in an interview once, said like a film is 49% visual and 51% aural, so audio. Uh, so yeah, audio gives you those finishing touches. So here are the guys from Resonate just working uh, on the, on the audio, and they were, they were awesome at it. Uh, we gave them a similar brief as Maxon did. We said, do whatever you want. But we said, you can make it weird. That, that's fine. So yeah, so while they're doing audio, 
and we made the animatic. We're like, all right, well, now we've had a lot of fun just playing around every day. It's now time to actually make something. So I have, I have proof of it. This is us working, working really hard to look natural. Uh, yeah, pointing, you know, Wacom tablets. You know, we're, we're a studio. This is, this is what we have. There's me, there's Simon, meetings. So yeah, hard at work. And we were hard at work on the animals. So now it's time to really break down what's going on with all these guys. So this is a fan favorite. Uh, this is a chameleon, which we nicknamed Jimmy. And he was one of the first ones that we started working on. So this is Jimmy. And this is just like the raw scan of it. I think that's a screenshot from Photoscan. Here's a render just to show the amount of detail in them. And then this is just uh, the diffuse, uh, like the color texture map, and we paint it on top of them. We also extracted a displacement map for him because that's where like the magic really came alive. This is like Jimmy with displacement, and the thing is that I really want to like emphasize is each animal, besides being a character, had its own technical characteristics that set it apart from the other one. For Jimmy, it was displacement and subsurface scattering. So here you can see with displacement, without displacement. Two very different animals, but, you know, cool, but maybe too much like a child. Yeah, that, that's more like it, kind of like more like a badass. So no presentation would be complete without a character turnaround. So this is where you can see all the details that we had just like a with Jimmy, you can see like all like those little like bumps that we gathered extra from displacement, uh, and the subsurface scattering just working just wonderfully. Yeah, and this is a uh, this was rendered with Arnold, and I must say we are all thrilled with how well the Arnold team and the Maxon team works together. Like we've never had such a tension between both developers just work together. So yeah, we're like cool. But what happens when we go in closer and uh, see what's up with the, with the chameleon? And some of the things just started not holding up, like the eye. So we had to, to model it. And the way that we modeled it is we just grabbed a disk. We used the Baroni fracture method. We Mo extruded it, added uh, some random effectors. Then we subdivided it. Then uh, we, we sphere wrapped it. And then also, because we're working with Arnold and we wanted to add variation, before we brought it to Arnold, we used the C4D variation shader on a per polygon basis and baked that out and fed it into Arnold to uh, get us like differences and specularity and, of course, diffuse, but also subsurface scattering. So that was a neat little way of doing things. So we decided to try and do a pattern out of it based around eyes, but it was a bit weird and alien, and they're like, yeah, no, that, that, that's not really working. Uh, so with the same thing with the push-apart effector, we're working on just like moving stuff around, which was the building blocks for this. This is basically just like the hardware render of many different effectors working together, but it's really nice just to see how that all just came together, and yeah, that's, I mean, that's all cinema. So while some of us were busy on patterns, the rest of us were also busy on other aspects. So here is, you know, using uh, the clot system, we just like dropped it on top with a lot of subdivisions and iterations, and it looked cool. Also playing back with, with patterns and stuff. Why not? Playing around with, with rim lighting and more fog. And that's when we started noticing that, oh yeah, we're gonna have to deal with the chameleon tongue at some point. So this is actually what a chameleon tongue is supposed to look like. We did the research. It's weird, but not as weird as when you just clone a lot of them and make them soft bodies and add some turbulence. And we're like, all right, this is a bit too weird. Let's, uh, let's not include this, even though it moves pretty cool. So with movement, this is uh, our character rig for Jimmy. And the funny thing is, is like we initially weren't going to rig any of them. We were just going to use bend deformers. But because we we're still waiting for models to get processed, we just went ahead and rigged basically, basically all of them. And 
Cinema's uh, rigging system proved to be really, really easy and effective. They were like, well, maybe we'll just keep doing this. Here is a quick play blast. You get to see uh, the rig in action. And the cool thing is like, when you have a rig as well, you can add all of these like, secondary and tertiary animation elements to it, which is really solid and just like the subtle details. I and mean, you can see the muscles kind of move. You can see the tail curling around and having some sort of movement. So, so not bad, pretty good. So now we move on to the armadillo, or as we call them, Arnie. So here you can see Arnie had his war paint on the top of his head. Yeah, very much in the style of, of Jimmy the Chameleon, he was very, very displacement heavy. So here you can see a render with all the displacement and it was just it was just really great to see how much detail we could extract from it, and it just like worked together so very, very well. So along with that, here is the UV map. So that on the left is a diffuse, and on the right is some normal maps. And yeah, I mean, looks pretty cool. Looks a bit like roadkill. Here is the rig, because like I said, we just couldn't help ourselves and set it to rig as much as we could. And it was nice because it was just like a nice versatile rig. And we made a neat little espresso rig for it. So yeah, nice and easy, customizable, artist friendly. Someone else could take the scene and then take it away. So the similar thing, like I said, with Jimmy the Chameleon is you can see it here is subsurface and displacement heavy. But something that Arnie has that Jimmy didn't have was the introduction of hair, just hair on a, like on a small scale, just to give it just the, just a little bit extra, so it's not just like a hard shell. So there it is, some hair, some hair on the underbelly, and it was nice because it gave it like a nice and tactile feel. Here is a, a setup of just like the grooming and the placement, yeah, and so that worked out really well. Here is some of our R and D for uh, the pattern. So like I said before, we we're like, yeah, Veroni, that's the one. That's our guy for the armadillo. So that later became that, which is similar to a Yater setup, actually, if you watched it earlier. I was like, there we go. And that's, this is a, that's kind of what it ended up looked like. This is an earlier one, but I thought I might as well just show you some of the stuff that you just haven't seen on the film already. So next up, we have the fox. And the fox we called Pedro. And the thing about Pedro is, this is like, it just amazed us at how well cinema's hair, A, how easy it was to just like groom stuff with cinema, but also how well it played with Arnold. So here you can see that's a diffuse map. And even though he looks like he lives in like a hunter's den, this is what we use to drive uh, the hair, like the color of the hair. But we did run into a small problem, which is when you 3D scan, uh, a hairy object or a fuzzy object, whatever, it sees the hair as just one volume. So we actually, if we were to add hair on that, he would have been just like a big puffy guy. So we had to shrink him down. And it was a mix of just like scaling uh, the polygons down by their normals and then reposing and sculpting some. And here is what he looked like. So you can see five layers of hair, all with different parameters, filling up the space that we removed before. So you can see it's pretty pretty matched, pretty one-to-one. -one. But yeah, had we applied all this hair to that extra, he just would have been a bit, a bit obese. So here's a, another turnaround. So yeah, I mean, great. Just all the detail, like all that, you know, all those splines that we could generate with the hair module. We, we love it so much. And then just how it plays together with, uh, with Arnold. Great. So if there's one thing that a, that a hair-based character does is all the stuff that isn't hair-based gets a lot of attention. And we're like, well, also, I mean, this, this fox also has really cool teeth and the mouth, so we're going to need to do a lot of close-up shots about it, so we need all the detail in the mouth. And uh, it was kind of like uh, the presentation uh, right before with, uh, with Mark from Render Baron. We, uh, also had to deal with mouth stuff. But mostly because we didn't really want to 
sculpt too much, we were running out of time. So we resorted to image-based textures. And you're going to gonna have to bear with me, because this is going to get just a tiny bit gross. But I had to deal with it, so I'm going to take you guys around for the ride. So this was the initial scan of the inside of the mouth. And we're like, well, that's, that's messy, and that's never going to hold up. So we need to use an image-based texture. So through image banks, we found, yeah, just dog lips. And let me tell you, you don't want to be the guy at work staring at dog mouths all day and having them on your wallpaper. It's, well, not your wallpaper, just on your desktop. So yeah, that was gross. That was my whole day. And yeah, that was it. So that was just the lips. Then we had some redness for the mouth for around like the gums, because we knew we wanted to displace it. And as it displaced, it should also have some variations in the diffuse color. And what we were saying before about the roof of the mouth, we had to get creative because there's no good pictures of the mouth of a, of a dog. In fact, the ones that you find are really gross. So we had to get this guy. And you're like, what is that? And why is it in the mouth of a fox? Well, it's a hippo. But nobody knows and nobody cares because it looks good. And then finally, that's the displacement map for the gum, so what I was telling you guys about. And you know, also, just some random stuff painted for the roof. And so all that hard work, so much hard work, for four shots less than 15 frames long. But that's just, that's just the glory of production. That's just what happens. And yeah, so now let's talk about animation with him. And so he also rigged, just like the other ones, but he has a nice little a difference, which is, here you go, you see, so legs, head, neck, you know, he moves around, mouth, but he also is expressive in his eyes, and he can look, he can look pretty goofy if you get the, the settings wrong. So goofy that, like, our mean little fox ended up at one point looking like something out of, like, a cartoon, and we're like, all right, that's great, that's cute and all, but it's not really, it's not really versus and battle-worthy. But then when the rig goes wrong and the mesh disappears, you get this terrifying result. And we're like, all right, uh, yeah, let's not do that. Let's not get that happening. So now we move on to uh, the crab, which we, we didn't really have a name for him. Don't know why. And the thing about him is this was the only 3D scan that we outsourced uh, to, to an open source uh, depository. And the thing that happens with, with free stuff is you're lucky to have textures, but you're even luckier to have UV maps. So we just had to get creative with like, uh, the different projection methods in cinema. And we just like, move stuff around and try different projection methods, ba bake them around. And that's how we were able to get like, different variations. So I mean, here's like, similar texture as before, and now with the war paint, some subsurface scattering, a lot more subsurface scattering. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty cool. Then we were also playing around with displacement, but he looked crispy. It looked like he'd been put through a deep fryer, and we're like, no, no, that's not cool. So this is what we ended up with, something a bit more shiny, uh, more traditional, if you will. And this is a good time to talk about what you see in the background. So the background, we really wanted to have a growing coral pattern, uh, but that was proving to be a bit heavy and not really customizable uh, to do in cinema. So what we did is uh, we used the introduction last release of the Houdini, Houdini engine to just make a setup real quick, which worked so nice in cinema. We could just put any geometry under it. And uh, Simon, who, who made it, made it really, really artist friendly. So you could set the iterations, voxel size for preview, change the noise settings and the speed. And it was just great just being able to get basically the Houdini power, but just living in cinema. And it was just great. So here is a play blast of it in action in cinema. And you know, with the, the color is just like a, a 3D, 3D gradient from in the Y direction. So nothing fancy about that. That was that geometry was just like a cube, I think. This is it rendered on a uh, on a torus. And again, no UVs. Just really nice mapping built into cinema. With that, this is the, uh, the, the render of, of the pattern. And again, same thing as before. 
but it's just really nice just being able to have Cinema be the home for Houdini, and it just made everything really nice and easy. With that, going back to animation, so the rig for the crab, this was like a lot of fun because it just had so much character. I mean, he goes and goes, goes like that. And funny enough, he is like, even though we made rigs for every single character, he was the only one that actually got like a walk cycle, but it was only two seconds long, of course. But then again, we're not necessarily character animators, so two seconds, that was, that was plenty. And now we get to talk about the owl. And the owl was a very special, special case because when we got the 3D scan, we were terrified. Because we got that and we're like, oh my god, how are we going to make this work? Like, we have already invested so much design and research into this, and there's no way. There's no way that's going to look good. So we looked at the UVs, and we're like, oh, wait, how are we going to paint patterns on that? So we thought it was a nightmare to begin with. So how do we go from this to this? It's a surprising, surprising difference. And, uh, and for the most part, it's the exact same mesh. But here is where our favorite for this project, the hair module, saved the day. So what you can see is 21 layers of hair just scattered all over. And all of them you know, art directed, combed and brushed and feathered. Uh, what we did, the only difference we did to the mesh was we smoothed it out and we just like, got rid of like, the wings at the end because we're like, that's all just going to be hair. So here's that same owl, but just with, uh, with uh, some lighting and rendered in Arnold. So I must say, thank you, Maxon and C4D, for just making an amazing hair module, because otherwise, we would have been terrified. And I've showed you rigs for all the animals, but I won't show you one for the owl. But just to show you that this is all done with bend deformers, and you know we applied like the, the design principle of KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. If you're only going to see it for two seconds, don't bother making a huge rig. Just you know, just deform it, and it works. And then finally, our last animal, uh, the butterfly, or as she was known as Bianca. So now Bianca proved to be too small to scan. I mean, if you see the scale there of uh, the hand, the ratio of hand to butterfly, that was going to be just not picked up very well. So instead, we modeled and uh, you know, uh, sculpted it, rendered it with a nice little clay shader. Then we painted uh, a hair map for it, which actually ended up also being the diffuse. And here again, you know, we ended up, we love the hair module, so we ended up using it more. And you can see there's hair like, and all the little details, even like at the bottom of the legs, there's like different hair setups for it. Here's a quick time lapse of just how we, uh, we did the wings, you know, just a plane and then sculpting it for that extra detail. And so we were, we were like, all right, this is good. This is going to work. And then we rendered it. And it just looked a bit flat. It's like, well, it's, it's, missing, it's missing something, and it needs a lot more work. And so we thought, well, what if, because it's worked so well, what if we just add more hair to it? So here, each wing had 2 million hairs. So four wings, 2 million hairs, 8 million. Here's a close up. So you can see how it just all has a nice flow. And the way that we like, got the, all the differences was like we just painted a, a texture map to, to guide the, the length and some of the direction for the hair. And also, we used that for the transparency and translucency. We also really wanted to use iridescence with uh, the bug, because A, it was a new feature, but also bugs are mostly iridescent as well in some aspects. So we used the thin film shader. And it was really nice because it allowed us to get many different variations. It just worked really well. But we also started using the inverted ambient occlusion to start to guide different layers of subsurface scattering in it. Because it was something that we found out too, too late in the game about that. We were like, oh, we should have just been doing this the whole time for all the other animals. But lessons learned. And yeah, so this is a, a, first, a first comping test. And just a close-up of, of the final is that. And there's something just like that we really like about that, because like 
the hair doesn't necessarily look like hair, but it gives you this extra tactile feel that just would just no amount of displacement would have really gotten you that. And it looks nice and matte. And then, you know, playing around with the iridescence on the transparent parts. So we're really, really happy with that. Now, going on to the actual rig for the Bianca, it was a, a nice, little, nice little rig. It was great using just like the, the dynamics for like the joints, but also the, the jiggle deformer as well, just for that extra, extra sway. It's like just really, really satisfying to watch. Yeah. Here's a turnaround because, you know, it wouldn't be complete without it. And this is where you can really see the thin film shader really shine, literally. So you can see, like, just the colors and the variations just travel around it, especially in, like, the thorax, but also the wings and the eyes. But the thing about the eyes is, like, the model initially didn't have those little, like, micro eyes that you find in bugs. So what we did is we decided to just get clever with it. We had just, like, an easy mesh, but we knew there was the honeycomb uh, way of... Uh, affecting a, you know, your MoGraph cloner. So here's like a quick, quick way that we did it. And then we baked out our displacement for it and then mapped it over the body, isolated uh, around the eyes, and bam, instant, instant bug eyes. So that's like a nice clever approach to it, but that's, that's all I got for the animals. So now let's go to uh, the hero shot and the secret animal. Or like I like to say, because Jimmy was cooler than Terry, and we'll get to that in a bit. So I showed you guys before, this is the original design. So we're like, all right, let's go with that. Then we were blocking and staging it. And so this is where we started like really putting some of the lights around it. And being like, all right, cool. Yeah, something like this, that'll work. Then we replaced it uh, with now finally bringing in some of the cloth and with some of like the rigged characters and started doing some initial animation to it. And then this is uh, our final lighting. And so do you notice something different here besides the owl? There's, there's a new dude there. There's, there's a frog. And the frog's name is Terry. So Terry was actually modeled in ZBrush, but he was made pretty in cinema. And he was just, just made even prettier in cinema with Arnold. So the nice thing about uh, Terry the frog was his, you know, he was just like nice, nice pattern based and it was easy for him to get camouflaged. But then again, that didn't really make it into the final film. Then here you can see a texture that we made by cloning spheres onto the surface and then getting clever with the proximal shader because we were thinking at one point the animals might just like react to like the battles and stuff. But yeah, that didn't make it. Terry didn't get uh, his own portrait. He was barely in the film, but he just got his 15 minutes of fame. So there you go, Terry. And then finally, we get to talk about uh, what we call Dalston, or what I like to say, it's all fine and dandy until spaghetti looks like candy. And this is something that surprised everyone, and, and that's good, because that's what narratively it was supposed to do. It was supposed to break the narrative and uh, make everything feel raw. It was supposed to like com come out of left field and just blow you away. And yeah, so these are some of our references. So we want to play with deconstruction and melting and the interior versus the exterior. And here you can see we started slicing all the animals and animating the slices come out. Then we initially just exported an animated uh, alembic so that in Houdini, Simon could figure out how to make that work. So once he did, he made an HDA out of it, uh, HDA out of it for us to load into cinema. And then we could just go crazy and put it on all these different slices so when something we wanted for it to work. And yes, yeah, so there you go. And so these are like the, the different passes of just like different HDA assets working really well within cinema. And yeah, it's like a Good teamwork between uh, Maxon and Side Effects. You guys, you guys are paving the way. So yeah, to, to wrap this all up, it was really nice seeing Cinema and Houdini play really well together. It was really convenient to just be able to have a nice workflow between, you know, just transferring uh, geometry between Cinema and ZBrush. It was great just working with the new Substance Link. 
And finally, it was, it was amazing to just have Arnold and Cinema play so nice together and put, combine all our efforts together into something that we were proud to show you guys. And so what I keep telling people is like, even if Maxon hadn't approached us to do this project, the process would have been the same. It would have started and ended in cinema, because I mean, that's the way we do things for the most part at Mambrous Machine. We started out as a C4D studio, and, and we still are. So thank you, Maxon, and thank you guys for coming.